pleasure of introducing our speaker for this evening. Dr. Rogers studied medicine at London University in England and specialized in ophthalmology at the University of Toronto. He became American board certified in 1982, a fellow of the Royal College of Surgeons Canada and a fellow of the Royal College of Surgeons UK in 1988. On returning to the Bahamas in 1984, he was appointed to the post of Chief Ophthalmology at the Princess Margaret Hospital and entered private practice the same year. He has extensively studied economics and has published two books focusing on the Bahamian economy. He was, found, he was the founder of Omni Financial Services, which offers a cadre of financial services, including money transfers, micro lending, bill payment services, debt, debit cards, cash management, and a soon to be launched mobile money platform. Join me in welcoming Dr. John Rogers. Good evening, everybody. I'm really happy to see you come out on this cold night and not snuggle up in bed with you. one closest to you and hot chocolate. And uh, I'm going to try and warm your hearts with a bit of economics tonight, if that's possible. So I'm going to talk about clinic controls, which is a very arcane subject. I, I believe arcane means not many people know about it. But it's very important because it affects the Bahamian economy and therefore it affects each and every single one of you, your standard of living and your daily lives. So I'm going to divide the talk into different parts. The first part will be what exactly are exchange controls. The second part, how they came about, the advantages, disadvantages, and are they justified now in the Bahamian economy. And I'm going to talk about some alternative uh, currency systems. So we're trying to give you an overview of, of uh, what's going on. Now, if at any time you want me to stop and explain something, I'd be more happy to do so. So if you look at the um, reasons up on the board here, to allow countries to better control the economies and maintain economic stability, especially important for countries with a weak currency or developing economies. Now I want you to focus on countries with a weak currency. That's the Bahamas. So let's look at the history. After the Second World War, there was tremendous economic instability. Remember, millions of people got killed, total infrastructure uh, damage in the UK, in Germany, in France, in Poland, all over, the world, all over uh, Europe. So what happened was the powers to be got together at Bretton Woods in New Jersey, uh, all the leaders, to try and determine what could be done to help stabilize these economies and get economic growth back on track. And they met at Bretton Woods, and what came out of that was the Bretton Woods Accord. Now, out of the Accord came two very big multinational uh, entities that you all know of, the IMF, International Monetary Fund, and the World Bank. The mandate of the World Bank was uh, eradication of world poverty. The mandate of the IMF was monetary stability on a global basis. So as the U.S. was the one economy that came out on top during the war, because remember, they were never invaded, they never bombed, although they got bombed in Pearl Harbor, it was decided that the U.S. dollar would be pegged to gold, and all the other currencies would be pegged to the U.S. dollar. So that provided stability for trade to start to occur again, it prevented speculators from speculating on currencies because the currencies were, were pegged. And after a while, <coughs> recovery began. So in 1979, the, the Brits decided that it was time to come off of the peg, to get out of exchange controls, because everything had stabilized. And so in 79, they came off the peg. In 1974, the Bahamas Central Bank uh, was created. Uh, originally, there was a currency board then a monetary authority, and in 74, we went to a central bank. But we maintained exchange controls. Now, the IMF um, is the entity that basically determines what happens with exchange controls. The, the group of rules and regulations for the articles of agreement. And Article 4, 
pertains to the uh, exchange controls specifically, as it pertains, say, for example, to the Bahamas. So, part and parcel of the deal is that the, cap the current account, which is the account dealing with trade, money's coming in and out, has to be open at all times. The reason for that is because we need food and we need fuel. So that account is open, and the only time the central bank can step in and close down trade is if the reserves are threatened. Because remember, you need US dollars to buy things from away. The capital account, on the other hand, is the account associated with direct fund investment, or we say um, uh, Rick Lowe wants to invest $100 billion in Europe, that's the capital account, that's money leaving the Bahamas. They put a clamp on that because they always want to make sure there's enough money in the current account to look after our basic needs. And the, 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 the level of dollars needed, in US dollars that is, in the central bank in reserves is 750 million US dollars. So just remember that number. That's equivalent to three months worth of imports that pay for the things that are coming in. And, this, and the IMF comes down to the Bahamas every year for what they call a level four consultation to make sure that we're doing what they would like us to do. So when you have a fixed currency, you have to have capital controls. Now the Bahamian dollar is pegged one to one to US dollar. Okay, it could have been one to 50 cents or one to 75 cents, but it's decided that it would be one to one because of tourism. Because it's just inconvenient for tourists to come and if it's only 50 cents, they have to you know, do the calculation and you know, not everybody's good at math. So one to one kept it very simple. It also means the capital control so that if you as a Bahamian want to change your money into US dollars, there's a limit to what you can do. And vice versa, a foreigner changes their monies into Bahamian, there's a limit. There's also a limit on who can provide the exchange. And that's limited to authorized dealers, in other words, the retail banks. There's also a restriction of currency across borders. That's why you, it, it, the central bank limits you taking monies out of the country. And to a certain extent, even foreign entities here who wish to repatriate the funds. They want to make sure the reserves are at a level to allow the banks and others to repatriate their funds. In some countries, there's a minimum stay requirement. When, that is, when money comes into a country, you can't just go out very quickly because I'll show you in a second, rapid inflows and outflows of monies into a country can destabilize uh, a country's uh, economy. So that's what it is, and that's how it came about. And let's talk about some of the advantages. Now let's say uh, Rick, you know, Rick is the big man at Nassau Motors, he owns Nassau Motors, most of the shares I believe. Let's say Rick wants to buy a whole bunch of Honda cars out of Japan. And he wants to buy them three months from now. He wants to know that the dollar, and by extrapolation of the Haman dollar, is not going to change in value against the yen, the yen being Japanese currency. So if you have a fixed exchange rate, he can be assured that his dollar is going to buy X number of Honda Accords. Now, let's say you get another guy who's a direct fund investor, and he wants to invest monies in the Bahamas. He wants to know that his US dollar is going to get one-to-one -one return for every Bahamian dollar he invests in. So when he builds that hotel, he wants to know that the Bahamian dollar is not going to depreciate so he can get his money back on a one-to-one -one basis. Also, as I said to you, um, when there's rapid flows of currencies into countries and out of currencies, that can destabilize the country. So the, the, the reason why monies flow between countries is primarily due to two reasons. One is interest rates. If the interest rates are higher in one country compared to another, people will seek what they call yield. They want to put their money in the bank in that country with a high interest rate so they get a better return. Make sense? Okay. Or if there's a lot of liquidity, let's say Rick now um, wants to take some of his $5 million out of the bank and there are no productive investments for him to put into invest in the Bahamas, well, he looked to maybe <coughs> China or India to invest his money, we can get a better return. So in high pools of liquidity in one part of the world, usually the developed part of the world, they move into the developing parts of the world, the emerging markets, as they call it. So what happens when all this money goes into the emerging market? The stock market goes up, 
the housing market, boom. People got more money in their pockets, and everything's sweet and juicy, right? Mm -hmm. But all hell breaks loose when the money goes back out because interest rates change, right? Stock market collapses, the housing market collapses. People say, well, where the hell's all the money gone? And you get a bust. So that's why, that's one of the good things about uh, fixed exchange rates. Um, and also, uh, it limits speculation. Speculators will speculate on the uh, floating exchange rate. So if the dollar is, is floating against, say, the yen, then speculators may, if they think the yen's gonna go up, they uh, buy the yen, and of course, they're buying the yen in bulk, they'll cause the yen to go up, and when the yen goes up, they sell, and they make an interest-free arbitrage profit. That's what George Soros did to the pound in 1991, and he made billions of dollars. I know Giorgio had some um, shares in, in Soros and Quantum Fund. Right? Giorgio? No, you didn't? Okay. <laughs> Sorry, you didn't. I did. Okay. <laughs> now, there's some disadvantages, however. Financial repression and hidden fees. So let's go through some of those. Because Bahamians can't readily invest their monies overseas, they're forced into investing it locally. So what's the, what's the most common investment people put money into locally? Real estate, right? And that's why one of the reasons why real estate costs so much. And that combined with the high transaction fees makes it almost prohibitively expensive for the average person to invest in real estate. I mean, you rest I think twice before you invest in real estate these days. <coughs> with the VAT and the legal fees and this fee and stuff. I mean, it, it, it's madness. Okay, you have another alternative. You can uh, put it in a government bond. But remember now, two years ago, uh, our sovereign debt got downgraded, so one level above junk status. So they're not quite as safe as they used to be. So you've got to think twice about that. What about BISEX? <laughs> yeah, what about BISEX? Well, uh, BISEX is very thinly traded. Capital gains uh, are minimal. And there is a, a lot of what I call price fixing with, with, at BISEX. And that's actually the most egregious sin in the stock market price fixing. So the shares don't go up according to supply and demand. Uh, if they go up by a certain amount, more than 10% or down by 10%, boom, they fix it, lock it. The shares can't go up or down anymore. That's why the Bank of the Bahamas the shares, when they were in, in the, in the um, I have to say word, but when they were in trouble a few years back, never changed in value. The bike was worth nothing, but the share stayed at five dollars and twenty cents. Price fix it. Um, and then bank CDs. Well, <laughs> you know, if you have money to bank CD today, you're actually losing money, right? With the service fees, no interest, or 0.003 percent interest, inflation, you're losing money having your money in the bank. But financial repression forces you into these types of investments. <coughs> now we all know from uh, portfolio investment theory that you need to diversify your investments. That's why you buy some stocks, you buy some bonds, you have some cash, you have some real estate, you have some gold, because you diversify. And you diversify geographically, from country to country. So you have a little bit in India, a little bit in Russia, a little bit in China, a little bit in Bahamas, wherever. But if you have your whole portfolio in the Bahamas, and things go belly up here, then you're in the hole. So it's, it's financial repression. Uh, what about the hidden fees? <coughs> I hear people say all the time, my blue mullin is as good as the, as, the, as the greenback, right? Well, is it really? Because if you're selling money to somebody to the bank, you gotta pay swift fees, you gotta pay stamp duty, and by the time you send that money out of the country, you're probably looking at, if you send $100, you're probably looking at sending $94, right? $95. Uh, if you go to Cambio in, in England or the States or wherever, it's a 5% fee. Uh, if you go to a money transfer company, it's between 3 and 10%. Uh, if you use your credit card, and this is one, I want you all to check your credit cards the next time you go when you come back home. <laughs> because sometimes there's a 10 to 15% charge on your credit card for using it abroad. Check it out. And the central bank, if you want to send money to a central bank, there's a premium you have to pay going out, and a premium you have to pay coming in. So if you have $100,000 and you, and you uh, invest abroad, you've got to pay the central bank, I think, for five grand, bring it back, about $3,000. So you're 8% in the hole before you even start. And given that globally now returns around 6 7% if you're lucky, you know, you've got to do two years of, of, of 6 or 7% just to come back to, to, to break even. 
So those are the hidden fees. So what's the justification for exchange controls now in the Bahamas? Well, it's not economic instability. We've been through that. The war's long over, right? It's not that we're developing an economy anymore. I mean, we're, we're pretty mature now. It's because we have a weak currency. People don't like me saying this, but it's a weak currency. I'll tell you why. Yes, it can be used in the Bahamas as a medium of exchange. But every time you use it to buy something, remember, that thing that you're buying has been imported in 90% of cases. So essentially, you're still dependent on US dollar. Okay, not the payment currency. It has a nominal value of one to one in US dollar because that's the way it was set. But what would be the exchange rate value? If, if our currency was to float against the US dollar, what do you think the value would be? It wouldn't be very much because there's such a demand for US dollars because we import, and such a little demand for the Bahamian dollar because we don't export that much. So I have what I call the ballpark value of the Bahamian dollar. <coughs> What's that? That's the money supply, M2 money supply, which is about $6 billion. Um, and on top of the equation, you have the number of US dollars sitting in the central bank at any point in time in reserves, or 1.5. Uh, billion dollars. And then you have about 500 to a billion or so US dollars in pillow money, mattress money, whatever you want to call it. People just holding it at home. So ballpark value is about 15 cents to 20 cents. Maybe 30 cents max. But what's the utility value? That's the real value. What can that blue marlin do for you? It can't do a doggone thing for you when it's used outside the country. It can't buy you anything from, anything from away, right? It can't be used to repay uh, uh, U.S. dollar debt. And uh, in the event that it was a floating currency, perhaps it could be used to help to defend the currency. So it really has great utility. So what we need to focus on really is the U.S. dollar. So the reason why the central bank needs to have the U.S. dollars in the, in the central bank is because you maintain the peg, 750, and for food and oil. Those, those are the main reasons why you have to have the US dollars there. So what we need to look at is other sources of US dollars. Now, we know because we import what we export, we are not producing enough goods and services to the fact of the matter. Bahamians are not producing enough goods and services for export purposes. And that's why we short the US dollars every year. Now, you can't take a bunch of people, like let's say 200,000 working people, and over the course of a year, and you, I'll show you in a minute, it's about a billion dollars short every year, and make them more productive overnight. It ain't gonna happen. I mean, there's no way in God's earth that's gonna happen. So you have to find a source of US dollars from somewhere else. <coughs> so where are the other sources? Well, um, what happens now is we get money coming in from tourism, that's an import, food in terms of seafoods, pharmaceuticals, a little bit. Uh, direct foreign investment, when Atlantis is built, Bahamas built, money comes in. But not as much money as you think. Because if the Bahama project was a $4 billion project, how much money do you actually think came into the Bahamas? Probably four or five hundred million. Because the, the materials, the, the, the goods and services needed to build that hotel all come from without, not from within. I have another talk on dirt fund investment. I can tell you, it's not the panacea everybody thinks it is. Uh, US dollar borrowing. So if the government is short in, in, um, in, in, in cash, in US has to borrow, that comes in. Uh, inbound remittances, like money transfers and grants, but we're actually a send nation to Haiti and Jamaica as opposed to a receiving nation. Although, I'll tell you this, the more Bahamians are leaving the Bahamas now, especially young Bahamians are coming in. Last year, 525 nurses left to go to Canada, USA. First time in the history of the Bahamas that more young people have left since the contract years way back when. And this is a very sinister sign and a indicator of what is happening in the economy today. Sale of domestic assets. When, when BTC was sold, that was US coming in. That was a one-off affair. Uh, dirty dollars. Dirty dollars 
are very important in this context. Uh, over a billion dollars of dirty dollars coming to the Bahamas. When I say dirty dollars, I mean not dirty money, but unregulated money. Or money laundering, human trafficking, drug smuggling, and arms, sale of arms. Uh, we have some portfolio money coming in, but not very much of that at this present point in time. Now, I just want to show you this little diagram because uh, this is actually a new theory I have coming out called the fluidics theory of how the economy works. But I want to show it to you the context of what I'm talking about. And you just got to remember two things. All economics can be, every single economic problem can be <laughs> sorted up in this one single diagram. Think of the economy as a big ball. And money's coming in, and money's going out. The more money in the economy, the bigger the economy. The more rapidly that money flows around, the bigger the economy. So if you look at the, the, the diagram here, you see up at the uh, top, the two-way tap, that's trade, money coming in and out through trade. To the left, top left, unregulated money, dirty money coming in and out. Top right, uh, money coming through a capital account, that is direct fund investment, government borrowing, grants, remittances. And then down the bottom, you have two taps. Those are internal taps. That's central bank printed money going to the economy, and uh, money coming to the economy from the retail banking sector to the fractional reserve system. Every single monetary volume issue, <coughs> economic students, can be worked out in a single, sim the simple diagram. Everything can be worked out. The flow can be worked out as well. For example, the Bahamas today, you have a liquidity trap of $1.5 billion of Bahamian dollars in the banking sector. They can't get out of there because they don't want to lend anybody and people's up to their head in, in, in debt. So that means what? The flow goes down and the volume goes down. So you can figure it out by just looking at this sim the simple diagram. Okay, so let's look at the balance of payments because that ties in with what we're saying. So in 2014, 15, 16, 17, and 18, doesn't matter which year you take, slight variations on this, $1.3 billion went out as opposed to net going out and coming in. So we were short $1.3 billion. In the capital account, $300 million came in through government borrowing, very fund investment. So you, we were 1.3, we were sorry, $1 billion short. The capital account always has to equal the current account, okay? But the central bank only had $800 million in it. You get me now, right? Okay. But if you actually look at the record, the central bank reserves been back down by 24 million. But if you look at errors and emissions, which is the clean word for dirty money, that was one billion dollars. So without the underground dirty economy, we would have had a balance sheet devaluation of the Bahamian dollar. Because 750 level would have been breached. So it means our economy is being supported by dirty money and is unproductive to the tune of a one billion dollars um, U.S. every year. And that's cause for concern. That's cause for ports. So what are the implications of that shortage? Well, every year we consume what we produce by that $1 billion. And therefore, and that's because we have a trade deficit. If a trade deficit, by definition, you're consuming more than you're producing. As the underground economy, which is plugging the $1 billion gap. So remember, balance sheet devaluation. So what's the definition of devaluation? In a country with a fixed exchange rate either plans or is forced to reduce the value of its currency relative to the value of the currency of another country. So in our case here, had it not been for the dirty money, the central bank would not have had enough money to look after our U.S. dollar obligations, and we would have had to have devalued. So in this context, what's the central bank's policy? And I want to say to you, I'm not knocking the central bank in any form or fashion. I believe they do a wonderful job at what they're doing, because monetary policy is only one of the things that they do, besides regulating the banks, being the bank of last resort, providing uh, help to the government, etc., etc. But 
they have to do what they have to do, given the laws the way they are now. So I'm not in any way knocking. I'm not, I'm not, in fact, I'm going to compliment. I'm complimenting them. I will compliment them even more later on, and you see why. <coughs> in most countries, the central bank's role, as far as the economy is concerned, is to try and produce economic stability. So if the economy is down, they lower interest rates. If you lower interest rates, people borrow more money. If they borrow more money, they spend more money. If they spend more money, they consume more. They invest more, and the economy picks up. Now, what's the reverse? If the economy is booming, and everybody's borrowing, and everybody's spending, and everybody's consuming, then you get inflation, so the central bank steps in, and they increase interest rates. That's the very simple way of looking at it. They go up when it's booming, they go down when it is uh, sluggish. And I would say to you, had the rates gone down in 2008 and nine, I am almost certain there'd be more people in the homes today, more businesses open, and more people employed, like what happened in other countries. But the central bank's determinant in terms of monetary policy, they're guided by the peg. So let's see how that works. And I call this the paradox of the peg. So, let's say the economy is going well, and people are borrowing, the banks are lending, people are consuming and investing, everybody's happy. If you're investing and consuming more, it means there are more imports, so government's happy because there are more import duties, right? Okay, but then the central bank looks at the reserves and says, whoa, people are consuming more imports, more US dollars going out, reserves are going down, and then they have to step in and call the banks and say, guys, you got to ease up on the lending. So if you ease up on the lending, then fewer people will borrow money, there'll be less expenditures in the economy, and government makes less money. That's the paradox. Is that clear? Okay. That's a very important, this is a key point. So the central bank has a dilemma. What are they going to defend? The peg or the economy? That's always the question. The peg or the economy? And the peg always wins. So they have to monitor the reserves and titrate the policy to the reserves. And that's one of the reasons why our interest rates are always so high. So it has implications. The paradox has implications. I just mentioned to you the economic growth problem, the high interest rate problem. Now, we know that when the dollars, US dollars reserves go down, then they go down. So in effect, the whole Bahamian B dollar credit system is based on the number of US dollars sitting in the central bank. Key point. Key point. Devaluation risk. I'll come back in a second. Now, there is an Austrian, I had to put this in for my friend Rick, who is an uh, Austrian economist, uh, called Wexel. Now, Wexel is a smart guy. What Wexel said was, when, there, when the cost of capital is more than the return on capital, and it's 1.5, he didn't actually say this, but my interpretation is 1.5 to 2% more, the economy can't grow. So let's put this in, in local terminology now. If you look at the average cost of borrowing in the banks in the Bahamas today, uh, consumer loans, business loans, and mortgages, the average cost of capital is 8.75%. But the return on capital, and the proxy for that is the GDP growth rate, for well, the last 10 years has been 0.9%. So effectively, the cost of capital has been four times what Wexel predicted would slow the economy down. No, no business, except perhaps an ophthalmologist, can do well <laughs> in, a, in a bad economy. You've got a problem with your eye, I don't care how bad the economy is, you come to me about your eye, right? So I'm fortunate. But for most people, they're catching hell 
because they, they, their business can't grow any faster than the economy. And that's why you have a lot of closures. <coughs> that makes sense, right? Okay. Now, what about the devaluation risk? So you always hear people saying, especially on, on the radio, such a talk show, the Bahamian dollar never devalued compared to the US dollar. Absolute nonsense. Absolute nonsense. Our currency is overvalued, as I mentioned to you before. Grossly overvalued. So when you have an overvalued currency, you tend to import more than you should and export less than you could. Right? If it was only worth 50 cents, we couldn't import all the stuff we import. If it was only worth 50 cents, there'd be more tourists coming to the Bahamas. That's why the trade deficit is so big. If you have a trade deficit, it's directly related to the fiscal deficit and the private sector debt. That's why national debt and private debt goes up every year because we're consuming more and producing, and you've got to pay for it with borrowed monies. You know, it's all tied in. Now, the government often have a full sense of security of this one-to-one -one pay, and that's why they don't have any problem borrowing in US dollars. But like I said to you before, even if you're borrowing in Bahamian dollars, you're still essentially using US dollars to import. And our foreign currency debt now is about 30% of our total national debt. And the problem with that is if you have a devalue, then you get a balance sheet increase in the value of the principal. So the setup for devaluation is when you have massive levels of private and public debt, a very high um, a capital account deficit, when it's more than 5% uh, of, of GDP. And you have a lot of short-term debt, a lot of foreign debt, and when you have an overvalued currency. That is one of the six factors that predisposes to devaluation. So let's look at the situation now. Let's say the country has a lot of debt, and a Dorian comes. And that Dorian knocks the hell out of your province. Okay? So that will come. So now you're not generating any US dollars at all. So what happens to the reserves? They go downhill, right? They go down below 750, and then you have to devalue. That's, that's how it works. That's how the, these predisposing risk factors work. You have some, a lot of debt, and you have some externality that hits you, that you, you have no control over whatsoever, and boom, you devalue. So we need to relax exchange controls, and, or capital controls, and allow monies to come into this country. So how to do it? Well, one of the simple ways would be to allow, and I, I spent uh, quite a few nights uh, talking to this young man down here, Giorgio, I use young liberally, but I think it's a big help to me, um, talking about this, and why not allow um, Atlantis, Bahama, to pay Bahamas in US dollars? It's costing them to, to pay in Bahamian dollars because they got to take their money to the bank, uh, change it into US, I mean change it into Bahamian, that costs them money, and they're only allowed to have two weeks worth of US dollars, uh, so just, yes, for the, to meet their obligations. So it costs them money. They could pay us in Bahamian. They could pay the bills in Bahamian. There's, a ton, there's several billion dollars of Bahamian owned foreign currency out there. Bring it back in. You know, the reason why they call it pillow money and mattress money is it's like your sweetheart. You want to be, or your wife, you want to be right next to her all the time. That's why, that's why you want that money to be next to her. That's why they call it pillow and mattress money, right? Okay. Now, you also need to allow Bahamians to invest abroad in portfolios, investments, okay? And the reason why I say it is because people say, well, that's money going out. Yes, there's money going out, but think about the money coming back in, in terms of interest, dividends, and rents. And here's a statistic for you. In Bermuda today, as has been for many years, more money comes back into the country from the investment, portfolio investments of Bermudians that comes in from tourism. Now, we also need to allow foreigners to buy sovereign debt. Why can't America buy Bahamian dollar debt? And, you know, people say, well, if they buy the Bahamian dollar debt, uh, then they run the risk that if something goes wrong in the bond. They're qualified investors. They know what risk is all about. The fact of the matter is, yes, it's a different country, but the yield here on our debt is high, far higher than in the United States. Allow them to buy it. Who cares? We need to integrate the offshore banking sector with the domestic banking sector. Why? Because if you do that, what happens is more competition. 
Service fees come down, interest rates come down, and everybody's better off. But the other reason for doing it is that billions of dollars pass through the offshore banks in the Bahamas every year. Now, what happens with that money? None of the money stays in the Bahamas, by the way, okay? So let's say I'm a Frenchman now. I'm in France. Uh, and I send money down to the Bahamas. So it goes to Giorgio's bank, okay? Well capitalized bank, run by a good manager, Giorgio himself, okay? So now Giorgio then, he then passes that money on to uh, Royal Bank of Canada, say, the offshore sector. And then they then send that money on to uh, JP Morgan, or say, uh, Goldman Sachs in, in New York, who then put that money into US capital markets by stocks bonds. But what if just one billion of that money stayed in the Bahamas? Because that money could be put into business. Your company, my company, Bahamian dollar debt, corporate debt. I don't care where it goes. Once it stays here, but you have the government and the central bank will have to allow that to happen. And you talk about billions passing through. Now we only want a little bit, just one billion. That's all we need. Now we need to create an institution, a digital exchange. I see my, my good friend, Yossi Ramin here. He's a black belt in jiu-jitsu, judo, aikido, and every Saturday morning for an hour and a half, uh, uh, 50 times a year, he dashes me down, pulls my hair out, that's my hardly gonna hear that. <laughs> but um, <laughs> that's what he's trying to start right now. And so what is that? There are a lot of behaviors who have software products, IT products, that they want to put on exchange. A lot of Americans, a lot of Koreans, or Chinese, Japanese, everybody wants to put their money on this exchange. And then we, the public, can buy shares in that. Foreigners can buy shares in it. There's a whole new world out there. This would make business look like a dog on joke. All right? It'd be a billion dollars more in this than in physics. So we also need to create a Bahamian payment system. I call it the Bahama system or Bahama Pay. You know, China and Russia did this. Mm. What they said was, if, if our people are paying in, in renminbi or in uh, rubles, right, in Russia? Rubles, okay? And they're using a Visa MasterCard. Well, why does the merchant fee, that's the fee that the, they charge the merchants when you use your credit card, right? Why does that fee have to leave Russia, leave China, and end up in the United States in the processor's hand, or the Visa MasterCard's hand, or the, or, the, or the bank's hand? Why? We have $2 billion of domestic payments in, in, in Bahamian dollar payments and Visa MasterCard every year in the Bahamas. And 3 to 5% of those fees, in the form of merchant fees, leaves the country. That's US dollars flowing out. We need to create our own system, and the sand dollar will create that for us, and I'll come to that in a minute. Now, I'm going to skip over a couple of these because I, I still get the evil eye from Rick. Um, I'm going to the uh, UN Bahamian currency swap. Okay, and this is, this, I, I, I love this one. Okay, <coughs> you know we spent $800 million on oil and food every year coming in. The pay for it coming in US dollars, right? Okay, so. If we do, say, a $500 million currency swap with China, we give the People's Bank of China, their central bank, $500 million worth of Bahamian dollars, and we get $500 million worth of renminbi, okay? Now, we take that renminbi, those renminbis, and we go to Venezuela, buy oil. So now, we got the oil, they got the renminbi. They take that renminbi, and they go to the Shanghai uh, a gold exchange and they change for gold. Because all central banks now are buying gold like crazy. And there's a reason for it. So they're happy. Now China has half a billion dollars worth of Bahamian dollars, which they can only spend in the Bahamas. They have to come to the Bahamas, buy stocks, buy shares in your company, my company, buy government debt. I don't care what they buy. But what you really want them to buy or to do is to set up an agricultural sector in Andrews to produce food for us, to produce a agricultural industry for us, so we can feed ourselves. So we don't have to import the food. And the excess, the Chinese will buy from us. So we got a ready to <coughs> deal. We now have $500 million of US, which are not going out, staying in, and you're actually getting some coming back in from the export of that food. 
Okay, so enough about that for a second. Let's just talk about a few alternative systems for a few minutes. Sit down, Rick. And um, <laughs> let's, let's, let's talk about what, what are the alternatives. So you have a floating exchange rate, a dual currency system, a dollarization, or central bank digital currency. That's what I really want to talk to you about, but let's just go through, go through this quickly. The floating exchange rate, as I said before, that wouldn't work because our dollar would depreciate because there wouldn't be much demand for it. Okay? So we'll, we'll wipe that out immediately. And by the way, all of these, whether it's the peg, the floating, the dual, the dollar, all need dollars. That's the bottom line. They all need dollars. Whatever system you go to, all need dollars. So a dual currency system, you can only have as many Bahamian dollars as you have US dollars. So it has to be parity. That's the parity right there. So as I said earlier, we have about $2.5 billion in the system right now. We have $6 billion Bahamian. So if you go, go to a dual currency system at this point in time, the economy would shrink tremendously because the amount of Bahamian dollars in the system would have to come down to equal the US dollars. And that would be a, a disaster. So we need to find a way to get more dollars coming in through the route that I mentioned to you before to allow us to do that if we want to take that path. But in a dual, dual currency system, the central bank can then use interest rates to attract money coming in. If you want more US dollars to come in, increase interest rates. If you want to lower the US dollars coming in, it would lower the interest rates. But the other side of the coin to that is if you lower interest rates or you increase interest rates to attract the money coming in, it also slows down the domestic economy because it cuts up the cost of money and vice versa. The central bank would still be able to make signerage, which is the monies they have, they invest in treasury bills and bonds, you have US or Bahamian, and they make interest from that. And right now the average country, country makes about 2 to 3% in signerage, 2 to 3% of GDP in signerage every, every year. And they would still be in control of, of the banks. In a dollarized system, we don't use dollars. We no more Bahamian dollars. But then again, you would have to have $6 billion of US in order for that system uh, to work. The central bank would have no control over the monetary system. Uh, that would be control of monetary policy. That would be controlled by US monetary policy, which actually wouldn't be bad for us as consumers because interest rates are very low. You're able to buy your house now at a mortgage at 2.5%. You'd, you'd be laughing, right? And that would actually bring down the cost of, of living tremendously for everybody. But now the government, their cost of borrowing would go up because uh, they wouldn't be able to borrow at the same rate as the United States government, and there'd be a big premium because of the risk associated with that. So it'd be more expensive probably for the government to borrow, but it'd be cheaper for the average person. Now, a few words on this uh, central bank digital currency. I will tell you, this will be uh, the governor's legacy. He is probably the most progressive uh, central bank governor we've ever had uh, in the Bahamas. And I, I really have to take my hat off um, to him for what he has, has done, because he's taken a bold step. We're the first country in the world, first country in the world to have a central bank digital currency. And what that means is that the central bank is going to mint this currency, it's digital, but it'll be legal tender. It'll be the same as the paper money. So you'll be able to purchase this currency from some of the banks, some of the non-bank um, players, and the currency will be placed in your virtual wallet. And you'll be able to access it either by a cell phone, or by a card, or uh, online. And then transact in it just the same way as you transact in, 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 in the fiat currency. What this is gonna do, though, is gonna make the, the, the economy more inclusive. So all of those uh, illegal persons who may be here are now going to come into the economy because they will have access to digital wallet. They can't have access to a bank account right now, but now they will be able to. It's also going to mean that all that pillow money that, that, that Georgie has in his pillow, and, and Rick has in his mattress, next to his wife, um, <laughs> will also come into the digital wallet and to the economy because Rick is going to be concerned that if his house burns down, that money's gonna disappear, or somebody may steal it from Giorgio's pillow, right? So that's gonna come into the current. So that's gonna increase that, that diagram I showed you with the increased volume of money in the bowl, that'll increase the economic activity. Um, now, let's go back to Bahama Pay. I said come back to that. So now what's gonna happen is when uh, Giorgio uses his Bahamian credit card to 
uh, make a purchase at Luciano's. What happens now is the, the, the uh, merchant fee goes out to the United States. But now what's going to happen is they're going to have to filter on the POS at Luciano's. And that transaction will be routed through the sand dollar mechanism and it'll be paid out in Bahamian and the monies will stay in the Bahamas. There'll still be a merchant fee, but it'll be far less than the current uh, merchant fees associated with credit cards, but it'll be paid in, in Bahamian dollars and stay in the Bahamas. That's going to save us millions of dollars every year. Now, what's going to happen eventually is that there will be less money being deposited in the banks. Because you just use a little bit of simple math. Why would you keep your money in the bank if you have to pay fees to the bank and you're not getting much interest when you can keep it in your digital wallet and put it in a money market fund or invest in something else? So the banks now would have fewer deposits. Now remember now, banking is the best business in the world, as Georgie would tell you, because of the fractional reserve system. If you have $10 in the bank, the bank can lend out $100 based on that, in the Bahamas, in the United States, $150, okay? So now they'll have less money to lend out. But, by the same token, Giorgio is gonna have a whole bunch of money in his digital wallet. And Giorgio may want to lend me some money, we have extra money, so there's gonna be more peer-to-peer -peer lending. Again, my man, uh, Darcy Ramming here, he's starting a peer-to-peer -peer platform which will allow people to lend to each other. Okay? So it's going to be more peer-to-peer -peer lending. And the KYC with that would be better than anybody's KYC. You know why? Because Giorgio, he's going to want to know who he's lending his money to and make sure that dude's going to pay him back his money. Right, Giorgio? So it's going to be far better than any bank uh, lending, KYC, which goes down to Barbados to someone who doesn't know who the hell Giorgio is to determine where the money gets lent out to Giorgio. Right, Giorgio? Yes. Thank you, sir. Okay. Now, next thing is, and I'll, and I'll finish on this. No, no, not quite. When we send monies now, we go through Cambi, we go through money transfer companies, we go through the bank. What's going to happen when every single country has a digital currency is that you will go on your cell phone, go into a virtual exchange, change your sand dollar to euros, and send those euros to someone in Europe, and they'll have it. No bank, no money transfer company. You're just going through an international exchange, which will sit there in virtual, in virtual space, so to speak. But they will have pools of central bank currency from other countries, and they make the liquidity to allow the transaction to occur. So by definition, <coughs> capital controls will disappear. Because you, can't, you, cannot, um, you cannot regulate that. Enforce it, correct. That's the right word, Georgia. Thank you. Um, and the last thing is that, um, with the sand dollar now, digital currency, there's going to be an opportunity to reduce the national debt. All about debt in the form of bonds. When the bonds become due, they just rolled over. But now what's going to be possible is just to pay off that debt with sand dollars. And the U.S. is looking very carefully at this now. They're going to call their thing not the greenback. They're going to call it the, the greenback. And Pompeo and Trump are looking very carefully at doing this right now. They're gonna, because they, 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 they can never grow out of the debt, and unless they have a debt jubilee, which they won't, because the banks will go down, the only way to do it is actually use a digital currency to pay off the debt. So, in summary, all currency systems ultimately depend on the US dollar. <coughs> uh, capital controls relaxations are needed in order to get more dollars coming into the country and to grow the economy. Uh, and central bank digital currency will be a game changer. Thank you very much. Well, the Bahamian money supply is six billion dollars. So if you're going to go to dollars, that means you're going to get rid of those dollars, those Bahamian dollars, and you have to have Bahamian dollars, I mean U.S. dollars, to replace it. But right now, there's only about 2.5 billion in the system. So we'd have to find 3.5 billion dollars extra in order to keep the economy at the same level. 
Remember, GDP equals the money supply times the velocity of money. So if the money supply goes down to 2.5 from 6, GDP goes down by definition, so you have a low economy. That's the big mistake that Winston Churchill made after the First World War when they reintroduced the gold standard. And he reintroduced it at a level of gold that wasn't enough to support the money supply. And so they, can't, they had deflation and the economy even went, went belly up. One for the water. Yeah. Dr. Rogers, thank you. Um, I have a, because of all the regulations and world authorities putting the thumb on us, I have a fear of a cashless society. And I fear that the sand dollar is taking us in that direction. Well, okay, your, your fear with the uh, with OECD society. Is, 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 is this. I understand what you're saying. Think of it this way. We've been in a 20-year geopolitical economic warfare as the offshore centers like the Bahamas with the OECD, okay? They've done everything that they can to screw us, to put it for like, okay? Anti-money laundering, anti-French terrorism, uh, all the compliance stuff, uh, all the level tax playing field stuff, right. What they want to do, because they're going back to that diagram now of volume of money and, and, and flow, they don't want any dollars leaving their economies at all because they got so much debt themselves. The debt, the, the, the debt to GDP, private and public in Europe, is about 160%, okay, which is very high. So they're going to do whatever they can to stop monies leaving those countries, no matter what it is. And we actually have a, uh, uh, we, we devised a methodology, and we talk to the central bank now, to get around that all together. Because the big hammer they have over you is they can cut you off from the payment system, and they can cut you off from um, uh, the corresponding banks. So we found a way to get around the corresponding banks. And the sand dollar will allow you to get around the payment system so the money actually stays in, in the country. The other way to do it is they can get their citizens, like a Frenchman coming down here, they can get him because he still has citizenship. And they can get a French bank down here because they still have ties to France. But if the Frenchman says, you know what? I'm going to become a Bahamian citizen. They got no ties over me anymore. But we have to get over our schizophrenic xenophobic phobia <laughs> where we want people's money, but we don't want them. Okay? So we have to deal with that. Once we get over that, then that can deal with the offshore people, I mean, with the, uh, with the, Europe, with the OECD completely. Now, it doesn't matter, you know, you need to get out of your head. You see, Rick, you, you like um, some of these older people. Um, they, 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 can't, they can't get over uh, fiat. They, they like that, you know. No, 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 I'm happy to get over fiat. Oh, yeah. Yeah. But I'm, I'm afraid of, of the thumb of government. No, but the, the, the thumb of government won't be on you. What's okay. going to happen, actually, is that the, the, the central banks, you see, the, the pattern for what the central banks have done came about because of crypto. When Lagarde had the IMF and the other big guns, Larry Sumner and all the monetary elites saw what was happening in cryptocurrency, they let it go. But then they said, oh my God, you guess these, these, these computer geeks now control the money supply. So they said, you know what we're going to do? We're going to let the central banks create their own digital currency. But what they didn't understand was, they did that as a reaction to the crypto voice, right? What they didn't understand was it would actually undermine them because it would take the money out of the retail banking sector and put it into the hands of the people. So the whole banking industry is going to be disintermediated. Period. Thank you. Yeah. Georgia. Uh, Dr. Rogers, one question. Uh, what is the optimal number of monies for the world? Yeah, OK. So that's a good question, Georgia. And I'll tell you what the answer to that question is. Uh, in May 16th of this year, um, I actually came up with a new currency that I think I may have told you about that consists of the world's major currencies plus a percentage of gold. And it's perfectly hedged. And I want it to be a universal currency because if there were a universal currency, then there would be no flight of capital. There would be. Consider the answer. Okay? Yeah. Okay. So what you would do in a situation like that. So the number is one. You, you, would take, you, know, you, would take, you would take the GDP of each country as it stands now and make the assumption that that's enough money 
for that economy to be functioning normally. And then you issue that amount of money to each country in digital currency. But because it's digital, and, and because it's, it's, it's uh, universal, you, you wouldn't have any problems with um, uh, trade, with direct fund investment, uh, with currency flight, <coughs> with currency wars, because currency wars are, are fought over um, when economies don't do very well, uh, consumption's down, investing is down, net export is down, uh, government spending is up usually, which is not good, right? What do they do? They go to a currency war. They lower the value of the currency. And the currency wars are always followed by trade wars. And trade wars are always followed, usually, by wars, right? So if you have a universal currency, there could be no currency wars. So a, person, a, a country's output will be based on their productivity. Right. Yeah. We got time for one more, Mr. Forbes, so that we can take one more, and then uh, we gotta start wrapping up. So we've got the burning question. Uh, this guy, I'm, I'm getting people pointing over here to the gentleman with this hand up right there. Okay. Yes, sir. Uh, all right, Dr. Rogers, um, I appreciate your love for digital currencies. And myself, I've been in for the past two, four years, starting with Bitcoins, which is- Let me say this, I don't, I, don't, I, don't, I, don't, I don't think anything about um, cryptocurrency. No. It's a waste of time because it's too volatile, and has no utility. But anyway, go ahead. <laughs> I appreciate that perspective, okay. I would say that. But what you're ultimately talking about, as you say, your currency is basically a digital XDR. So why not the central bank create a digital XDR instead of behaving dollars? Yes. And you know, I was at an investment conference in May, of, uh, a week after I came up with the, the concept. And I spoke to George White, who was the governor of the Federal Reserve, Canadian guy, actually, the U.S. Federal Reserve. He said, the only problem with that, he says, you have an excellent idea, but banks would not go, I mean, governments wouldn't go along with it because they think they would lose their sovereignty. Okay? And that's why they wouldn't go along with it. And that's fine. And the reason why I call it the Janeiro, two words, genus, Latin for people, De Niro, Spanish for money, Janeiro, people's money. So what it is is this. It's perfectly hedged. It never goes down in value, it only goes up in value. So, for example, if you're sending, doing a money transfer, right now it costs a lot of money to send money to Jamaica or Haiti, right? And those countries depend on monies for their GDP. In fact, in the case of Haiti, it's 50% of Haitian GDP. But if 10% of that money going is spent on commissions to West Union money grant, then a lot of money starts getting there. So what's gonna happen is people will can go from Bahamian to Janeiro, and then send that, and it only cost them like half a percentage point to change it. And when it gets down there, they could use the Janeiro or flip it back to fiat. Same with online money purchases. You pay online with a credit card, Amazon, Alibaba, the credit card company takes it, I mean, the, the Alibaba takes a hit because of the merchant fee. If they use Janeiro, there's no hit. And traders, there's more than trillions of dollars traded every year, every day, you should say, more than stocks, bonds, real estate, uh, and regular trade put together. So they'll like it because we actually worked it out that you can actually predict what the value of the is gonna be five minutes, 10 minutes, one hour, 12 hours, two hours ahead of time using artificial intelligence. Institute.org, log in. There's some wonderful history on uh, the abolishment of the currency board and the things we should never have done. Uh, maybe we wouldn't be in a position that, that, but then we wouldn't enjoy Dr. Rogers. <laughs> but I got to thank you guys for coming very much. I got to thank the Templeton Religion Trust, whose sponsorship helps make our programs happen every year, and Compass Point Beach Resort. Uh, they are very instrumental in making, giving us the opportunity to bring the people in that we bring in. One quick other announcement, there's some refreshments in the back. Professor Forbes will hand them out to you. And last but not least, I'd like to thank you, Dr. Rogers.
I want to give you a little book, Basic Economics by Thomas Sowell, a common sense guide to the economy. Mm -hmm. but that you might be interested in Hamilton's curse. Because you might enjoy that in your leisure when you're not in your heavy economic career. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you again.